our speaker this month. Um, please join me in welcoming Elle Roberts. She is a writer, musician, and musician, 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 and founder of She Hive. So please join me in welcoming her. Good morning. Wow, how y'all doing today? Okay, I'm so glad. Thank you so much to Big Car, to Creative Mornings, to all of the incredible partners for having me here today. Um, this is actually my first Creative Mornings, so um, yeah, I, I find that a little weird. I feel like I should have come to one first and then done this, um, but that's okay. We're just gonna do things a little bit out of order. Um, I am the founder of an organization called SheHive. Uh, we create safe spaces to deconstruct gender inequity. So we, we talk about a lot of different issues related to gender and sexuality, race and class. And uh, one thing that we do uh, every couple of weeks or so, we hunker down in a coffee shop, um, usually in the downtown area, and um, discuss an article or something in the news um, where we can really focus in on what systemic oppression related to a gender looks like to us and how we can um, kind of apply everyday things to make our lives better to, to our everyday experiences. And so uh, every meetup that we have, we start with um, introducing ourselves. So we say our name and then our pronouns. And so what that might look like is, my name is Elle Roberts, my pronouns are she, her. And we do that because uh, we wanna challenge the assumption that um, when you meet someone, depending on what they look like or how they present to you, you assume what their gender is. And um, for a lot of people, that can be a really uncomfortable space. And so we challenge that for everybody. Um, so I would like to invite you all to a SheHive meetup right now. I hope you're okay with that. Um, so if you could just tell me your name and your pronouns, like right now, all together, just just go for it, and then we're gonna we're gonna get started. Okay, cool. Uh, so on the count of three, one, two, three. Thank you. How you feeling? Does that feel good? Okay, I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so glad. It's nice to meet all of you. This is awesome. Um, yeah. So. The other thing that I, I want to, to start with is kind of the meaning of what it means to be in a safe space. What does that look like? What does that mean? Um, and I think for me, safe space is less about feeling comfortable and more about sitting with your discomfort um, and embracing those moments so that you can either grow or regress, it's one or the other. When you're really uncomfortable, either you move backwards or forwards, it's one or the other. Um, and I hope we move forward together. Um, so I am very uncomfortable right now. <laughs> I'm very uncomfortable. Uh, I have a few stories to share with you about what, what broken means to me and uh, where I am right now in the grand scheme of life. Um, and I hope that, that we can all sit with our discomfort together and move forward together. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and drink this water and then I will really start talking. <laughs> oh, Sankofa. High on the heavens you soar, my soul is soon to follow you back to yesterday, son. It will remember me back to yesterday's moon. It will remember me. Rekindle the spirit into tomorrow and high on the wind. Sankofa flies again and again. Sankofa flies again and again. Oh, Sankofa, 
High on the heavens you soar. My soul is soon to follow you back to yesterday, son. It will remember me back to yesterday's moon. It will remember me. Rekindle the spirit into tomorrow and high on the wind. Sankofa flies again and again. Sankofa flies again and again. Sankofa flies again and again. Saying Kofa flies again and again. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for this chair. This is way better than the first one. You were right. I was afraid I would fall out of it. Um, Ten years ago, I uh, was 17 years old. I was a uh, freshman at... Purdue University. Yes, boiler up. <laughs> um, I was a freshman at Purdue, and uh, I don't know if any of you know this, uh, but the school's very big. It's about 40,000 people, roundabout, um, and the black population is very, very small. Very small. Um, so you, when, you, when you're on campus, you, you notice it almost immediately, um, especially if you're a person of color. Um, the black student population uh, kind of wavers between 1,000 and 1,500 roundabout. Um, so everybody either knows each other or you do the nod. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're friends immediately because you've all you've got. Um, and I, I spent a lot of time uh, between classes and, um, and not getting enough sleep, nearly enough sleep. Uh, at the Black Cultural Center, it was a uh, second home for me. It was a place of refuge, and I, I, I think it still is for me, um, and for a lot of black students on campus. And um, we, we did a research trip every single year. Um, so my first year, uh, we actually went to South Carolina, off the coast of South Carolina, to a little tiny island called St. Helena. I got to meet the cast of Gullah Gullah Island. <laughs> like, it, it's an actual place with actual people, the Gullah Geechee people, and um, Sankofa is one of the songs that I learned there. Um, this particular version is by Cassandra Wilson. And that, that song has really stuck with me for a really long time, ever since then. And um, the song, it, it represents, I think for me, uh, one of two symbols. When you see Sankofa, it's an actual West African symbol. And the, the one that I think speaks most to me, the one that maybe you might have seen before, um, it's a very large bird flying forward, and it is reaching back. On its wing, it holds a egg, and it's reaching back to essentially go and get it. And what that kind of roughly translates to is um, it's, it's never too late to, to go back and get what you've forgotten. And uh, those, those words have uh, made quite a mark on my life, um, that it's, it's never too late to, to go back and get what you've forgotten. Um, I, I spent quite a bit of time um, thinking about what I've forgotten or what I've needed over the last 10 years or so. And uh, I think a really good way to, to kind of recall the things that you may not have in the forefront of your mind but are always with you um, are really embarrassing family photos and home videos. And my family has a lot of those. We have quite an arsenal of home videos. My, my parents bought this, I don't even know what model it was, but one of those big hunker things where you record directly onto a VHS tape. I don't know. <laughs> like, so it was a very serious deal. So we have a lot of home videos. And um, if not for 
you know, we don't own a VCR anymore. That's totally not a thing. I mean, it is, but it's not. Um, probably the people in the back have no idea what that is. Like, what is a VHS? <laughs> hey, y'all, how you doing? Um, and uh, what my dad did, he, he got this machine that converts VHS tapes to DVDs. So that's nice. We kind of came into this century. Um, and he sent me a DVD of a home video that I haven't seen in a really, really long time. They tend to break them out when my mom is feeling really nostalgic and wants to like weep about how far we've come and how old she feels. And um, yeah, it, it is, it's been a long time. And so um, I, I kept this DVD. I, I hadn't quite watched it yet until a few months ago. And uh, in this video, I, I thought about showing it to you guys, but that's for me. I, I will tell you what's in this video. Uh, in this video, I'm about a little over three years old, real tiny thing. And uh, I am dressed in a uh, royal blue choir robe. Uh, it's the finest of choir robes, I think. Um, and I'm with the rest of the children's choir at the church that I was born into. And uh, it, was, it was really, it was like Sister Act Two style. It was like, it was very <laughs> elaborate. <laughs> um, and uh, we're in the choir stand singing a song. And, and honestly, the, the, the quality of the video is not that great. So like, you have to like find me first to figure out like what, what is so significant about this moment. Um, in the video, um, when you find me, because I swear I just got taller, I had the same hair, had the same forehead, like you can't miss me. And I am turned the exact opposite direction of the congregation, like just not, I'm just, I'm facing the opposite direction. I'm not, I'm not engaging with the congregation at all. I'm just not, I'm not. Um, and the whole choir is just kind of doing their thing and I'm, I'm just, I'm not looking at anybody. I'm, I'm looking at the cross in the back of the church, I guess. And I, I, I think my parents had always thought that perhaps it was because uh, I was a really, really shy kid had really bad stage fright, didn't really do well with crowds or being on a stage. And uh, there's a lot of proof of that. So I think that's definitely true, um, that it is quite a struggle to speak in front of people or do anything in front of people. And, um, but, but I think looking back at this video, uh, when I finally watched it, I'm 27 now, 10 years, after kind of looking at it now, I, I saw something very, very different. Um, that I didn't look nervous, that I wasn't shaking, I wasn't crying, none of the telltale signs of, of being uh, stage stricken. Um, I had my arms folded like so, and I'm leaning up against the scaffolding of the choir stand, like I'm just posted up chilling. <laughs> and I couldn't quite place that. It, it, it seemed kind of strange behavior. And I, I realized um, after thinking about it a little bit that I, I wasn't scared at all that I was completely comfortable doing all of that up in front of the, the congregation. And I, I think that perhaps it was um, maybe a first memory or even a last memory of me speaking up for myself, me being comfortable saying, you know, I am displeased with this situation and I am not going to engage with it at all. I'm just, I'm over it. I'm in the choir stand because I'm three. I'm not gonna tell my mom that I'm not gonna sing in the choir, but I am also not going to pretend that I'm having a good time right now. <laughs> I'm just not gonna do it. And I, I don't remember a time in my life where I was ever comfortable doing that. And I think what's scarier is I think that might have been the last time I ever did that saying out loud or with my body that like I'm uncomfortable with this situation and I'm not gonna participate. Like I'm just gonna shut this whole thing down. I'm just done. 
And I think that was the last time that I did that for maybe 20 odd years. And I think somewhere over the course of my childhood, I learned very quickly that uh, I didn't have the space to speak for myself and that, and that it's, it's not a nice thing to do to tell people that you're uncomfortable or that you're not pleased with what's happening. Um, and I learned to make myself very small. And I think for a lot of people, we learn that very quickly, that when we're small children, we're just, we can do what we want and what we please, and we're comfortable with doing a lot of things. And then the world teaches us very quickly that there are rules to the game, and you have to play them or else. And I don't know what the else is. It's a lot of different things, but or else. Um, I, I think that that year, my, my freshman year, when I was 17 at Purdue, um, was pivotal for another reason, that the lyrics of Sankofa, the song that I loved so much, uh, really manifested in a way that I, I didn't even imagine uh, would be possible at that age. And uh, I remember being at a house party. I was at a house party. I was 17. I shouldn't have been drinking, but there was a lot of liquid encouragement. And I was, I was sitting in a bed that didn't belong to me. It was hot pink. There were a lot of throw pillows. It was very bright in there. And I'm sitting with my friend, and we're holding hands, and I'm telling him the story of my life for some reason. And, and it was the, the first time that I had ever told anyone that I had been molested as a child. And the, and it was the first time that I had ever said out loud that someone I trusted violated my body, that someone I loved broke me and that I had been broken that whole time and never had the space to talk about it or think about it or feel it fully, that I had shut that whole thing, I shut it down and had been bound up for over 10 years. And I couldn't help but think that Looking back, I wish I had been as brave as three-year-old me in the choir stand, in my robe, posted up against the scaffolding, just being displeased with the entire situation and not being afraid to say so and behave as if I knew that something was wrong and that it was okay to, to be okay with that. And it's, it wasn't blaming myself, but just wondering how, how to let myself, how to let myself go and how to be open and honest about exactly where I am. And I think that that moment was kind of the opening of the floodgates, so to speak. Um, the first time that I had been vulnerable in my whole life, and I needed a red cup full of God knows what to get there, um, but I made <laughs> I made it, and uh, I I wanted to I wanted to share that story, uh, just a little kind of glimpse of my life, just kind of two small moments uh, to show what it means to be a broken person. Um, but beyond that, looking at how, how the last 10 years of my life, I've been kind of working towards connecting with other people who are also broken. And I think all of us in here have had experiences like that where we've 
been broken and stayed broken and been bound up in that brokenness so much so that you can't even really engage with another person and connect with somebody and be open and honest about exactly where you are. And over the last few years, I've, I've worked for uh, several nonprofits. I went from college to Teach for America and work for a host of different organizations. I've never worked anywhere for more than a year. I just don't like to stay put. I like to do a lot of different things. And people look at my resume, and they're like, what are you doing? And I'm, <laughs> I'm just making it up as I go. I'm just making it up. And something that I've noticed with nonprofits specifically, because that's where my experience is, and I don't think it's, it's a concept or a phenomenon that's like completely just about nonprofit organizations, but we like to fix people and fix things. Like we love to fix things and fix people. And the, the whole thing kind of boils down to what is the problem and how much does it cost to fix it? <laughs> and not that that's an issue, but I, I've been thinking a lot about what it means to fix and fix and fix and fix and, and try to tie all the loose ends together so much so that you miss the point completely, which is healing. What does healing look like? What does it mean to move beyond being broken and embracing those moments and being with other people who are also broken and moving together towards healing? And I, I wonder if perhaps it's, it's difficult or challenging to, to, be, to be truly vulnerable. And I, I, I think that's what it is, that so many of us need that, that extra nudge or that, that push to get there, um, whether it's a red cup of stuff that you should not be drinking or whether it's the friend who holds your hand in a bed that's not yours with a bunch of throw pillows, or if it's going back and retrieving what you've forgotten, the pieces of yourself that you might have lost or kept kind of held back in, in your mind, and you have to go back and get those things to remember exactly who you are so that you can remain firm and planted in the moment enough to acknowledge the, the times when you've been broken. Um, I think that practicing vulnerability is the most difficult thing that most people will never do, honestly. Um, that it's, it, it hurts to stay broken and it hurts even more to try and heal yourself and to do it with other people because you can't, you can't do it by yourself. You can't do it in a vacuum. Nobody in this room exists unto themselves that we're all in this together whether we acknowledge that or not. And it, it, it takes it takes a lot of different things, but perhaps one of, one of those things is, is being brave and taking on those really, really scary moments where you leave yourself open and exposed to, to others who are also open and exposed and, and trusting the fact that, that you will be embraced and that you will be challenged to, to move beyond the hurt and the pain and, and that you will be the better for it in the end. Um, and it's, it's a continual process. There, there, there is no kind of set beginning or set ending that that it, it has to happen over and over and over and over and over and over and over until you die. 
honestly, is it happens over and over and over and over and over until you die. And I, I think, I think that a lot of kind of where I am today, uh, one of those many nonprofits that I've worked for where I've tried to fix people when I was a broken person myself, um, which many of us are, um, that, that kind of my wellspring of, of hope comes from connecting with other people and, and especially, especially women. I think there's something really special about, about women and um, the emotional labor that we're expected to, to do for ourselves and for everybody around us, so much so that we don't address our own stuff. We're, we're always doing it for other people. And one of the things that's, that's happening tomorrow that's kind of an indicator of perhaps my own growth and the community of women that I'm a part of um, is, is a show. Um, how many of you have ever been to Women 317 before? Like two people, that's awesome. I'm so excited. So the, the other thing that, um, that we do, she hive, I mean, uh, another one of the safe spaces. So we do the meetups and then um, the other thing that we do is called Women 317. And um, I think there's such a robust arts and culture scene here in the city. And one of the things I thought was missing um, were the women. Um, you look at the bills for shows and you see a lot of dudes, like a lot of dudes. There's so many men and y'all do all the things and that's great. But I also know a lot of women who are doing really awesome things and I felt that we were missing or that we were there and gone unacknowledged. And something really special about doing a show just for women, um, it highlights the fact that we are we are doing the work and we're here and we are we are doing it together and it it's another thing to have a space where where you can be vulnerable and express yourself through your craft and through your through your gifts through your art and uh, this show we've been doing it for two years now tomorrow's the eighth show and it, it has been a, a space for, I, th I think the word is healing, that some of, the, some of what makes the show really special is that every artist that has graced the stage has embraced those broken moments and found the, the safety to move beyond it to ask what's next, to ask how, how can I use what I'm creating to help you, person who's in the audience or person who I'm sharing the stage with. And I, I have always wanted for my own story to not be in vain for what I've experienced not to stay with me. And as scary as it is to, to share with all of you and to be open, to be exposed, to be, to be vulnerable, to be to be ready for what comes next is, is all I ever could have asked for. And I hope that today, that sitting in our discomfort together, being in this safe space, being in this really big she hive meetup, this is the Biggest one yet, y'all. <laughs> Normally it's like 20 people. There's like 200 of y'all. 
being in this safe space together that that we can move forward together. Um, all of you, when you came in the room, um, filled out a name tag, and I believe the phrase on it is, one time I broke, and then you kind of fill in the blank, right? Um, I wonder uh, how many of you put down a thing, and I wonder how many of you wrote down something that may have been a little deeper and more personal. I don't know. It's Friday morning at 9 AM. I, I wouldn't blame you if you put a thing. I've broken a lot of things before. But what it takes to, to write something that isn't a thing that, that can't be fixed but has to be healed instead. I, I want to open the, the floor. Um, and I, I don't know if you're sitting next to somebody that you know, or maybe you don't know, um, but kind of leave you all a few minutes to maybe share one thing with the person who's sitting next to you about something that, that is broken in your life, something that needs healing, something that can't be fixed. Um, and uh, I, if you feel comfortable sharing, I hope you do. Um, I'm going to pick somebody. I'm going to get off the stage and pick somebody to come share with. Um, but I want to give you all, like, I don't know, maybe five minutes to share with one another. Just one thing. Um, it can be anything that you feel comfortable sharing with each other. Um, and then we can, we can move into the question and answer period. I think that would be a good time to do that. Um, so I'm going to. Open the floor right now. Find your buddy. Introduce yourself again. You can say your pronouns again so no one assumes. Um, and if you feel so moved to share a thing that, that needs healing. And perhaps you know today might not be the day that, that that fullness of healing takes place, but at least plant a seed um, that might blossom later. So uh, here we go. Are you, are you ready? Are you, are you sure? Okay. All right, let's do this. <laughs> 